now life in ancient Egypt comes alive with scenes of agriculture and industry. The nobleman and his wife are enjoying the fresh air in their garden pavilion. They are playing a game called Senet, a game for two players, a form of which is still played in Egypt today. Plowing is the first operation in preparing the land for cultivation. And here we see the plowman with his team and a simple wooden plow. After plowing, the heavy clods of soil are broken up with a hoe, and then furrows are made with the broad-bladed mattock. The sower scatters the seed from a small bag or basket, and sheep follow the sower to press the seed into the tough soil with their feet. Beside the houses in the background are pigeon towers. The Egyptians kept pigeons for food, and they were used for carrying messages, especially for the army. The fields are irrigated by means of the shidduf, which works like a balance, with a bucket at one end of a long pole and a heavy stone as a counterweight. Shidufs are still sometimes used in the Egyptian countryside. When the grain is harvested, the sheaves are carried to the threshing floor in a net bag hung on a long pole. When a thick layer of grain has been spread on the circular floor, oxen or cows are driven round to break up the ears of grain with their heavy feet. The next process is winnowing, when the grain is tossed up into the air so that the lighter chaff or husk will blow away on the wind. The grain is then taken to be stored in the silos. The scribe makes a careful record of all the grain which is being stored. This was important for taxation purposes as there was no money in Egypt in pharaonic times. Honey was used for sweetening by the ancient Egyptians, as sugar cane was not grown in Egypt in those days. Beehives were made of pottery tubes piled up in rows, and in some parts of the country, beehives are still made this way today. The River Nile was the main highway of communication in pharaonic times, so boat building was an important industry. Small boats were made of bundles of papyrus tied together with ropes. Such boats were used for short journeys and for fishing or hunting trips. Larger boats were made of wood, usually cedar wood imported from Lebanon. Wooden boats were pegged together with dowels and sewn together with ropes, as can be seen in the cross section on the bank. When the boat was put into the water, the wood expanded and the rope shrank, so the boat became completely watertight. A royal boat of this type can be seen in the museum beside the Great Pyramid of King Cheops at Giza. The palm tree was a valuable resource for the Egyptians. The trunk was used in house building and the branches provided fronds for making mats and baskets, while furniture and boxes were made from the ribs. The boxes were used for storage and as cages for small animals and birds. The Egyptians today still use the various parts of the palm tree for the same purposes. There were many different kinds of fish in the Nile and its canals which made good food, and fishing was also popular as a sport. One method of fishing can be seen here, where a net is stretched between two boats, and the fisherman hits the water with a stick to frighten the fish into the net. Let's see if he's been lucky today. which is mixed with water and chopped straw into a thick paste. This paste is put into a wooden mold and the bricks are then simply left to dry in the sun. As there is little heavy rain in Egypt, these mud bricks can last for centuries. The houses of the ancient Egyptians, even the palaces of the pharaohs, were constructed of sun-dried mud brick. The roof was made of split palm trunks covered with branches. The building was covered with a thick layer of mud, which acted as insulation against heat, wind and rain.
Glass making was introduced into Egypt after the military campaigns of Tutmosis III about 1450 BC, when captive glass makers were brought here from Syria. Glass was used for making beads, inlays, amulets and small vessels, which were formed around a core as glass blowing was not invented until the first century BC. In Ptolemaic times, Alexandria became a center of glass craftsmanship and in the Roman period, fine cameos were produced in the same city. The Egyptians are also famous for mummifying their dead. Mummification is basically dehydration and to speed up this process, the internal organs of the body were removed and preserved separately. The body was dried out by being covered with natron salt, a form of soda found in the deserts of Egypt. The body was then cleaned and embalmed and wrapped in several layers of linen bandages. Amulets were put between the bandages to protect the mummy from harm. The whole process took 70 days. Making is one of the oldest crafts in Egypt, dating back to about 6000 BC. The clay is kneaded with water and mixed with ground potsherds or chopped straw, which helps the finished pot to dry evenly without cracking. The potter forms the pot with his fingers as he kicks the wheel round with his foot. The handles are added afterwards and the pot is dried in the sun for a while before being fired. Now for a little Egyptian magic. shows the different stages in decorating a stone wall. First of all, the surface is leveled, then smoothed and polished with a piece of hard stone. Grid lines are marked in red on the prepared surface to ensure accurate enlargements of the original drawings. The artist copies the outline onto the wall, working from the sketch made by the chief artist on a small slab of stone or a piece of papyrus. Then the sculptor carves the design in relief with his mallet and chisel. Finally, the details would be painted in color to make the picture look as realistic as possible. Statues were partially carved in the quarry where the stone for them was cut. First of all, the block of stone is separated from the rock face by hammering wooden wedges into holes cut in the rock. The wedges are soaked with water, and as the wood expands, the block breaks away. After the stone has been smoothed and polished, the profile of the work is outlined on one side, and then the sculptor carves out the figure rounding it off first on the front and then on the back. Vases were made from various kinds of stone, particularly alabaster, a soft stone which was worked into beautiful designs. After the rough piece of alabaster has been polished smooth, the inside is hollowed out with a drill with a flint or copper bit. The vase is sunk into the ground to prevent cracking during drilling. Alabaster vases were used as lamps and for storing perfumes and precious oils. the carpenter and joiner were made of copper, wood and bronze. On the left a man is sawing a log of wood into planks. Other tools used were a hammer, chisel, an adze and a bow drill for boring holes. It was important 
important to the pharaohs that the army was well equipped at all times. Weapons included bows and arrows, swords, battle axes and spears, as well as shields and throw sticks. The horse-drawn war chariot was introduced into Egypt by the Hyksos from Western Asia around 1700 BC. Perfumes were very popular in ancient Egypt and consisted chiefly of fragrant oils and fats. The juice is extracted from sweet-smelling flowers in a bag of heavy canvas, the ends of which are twisted in opposite directions with wooden bars. This scented extract is then mixed with oil or fat as a base. from the flax plant was used by the Egyptians for clothing and many other purposes. Bundles of flax stalks are pulled through a large wooden cone to remove the tops and leaves. The stalks are soaked in water for a few days to soften them and then beaten with a wooden mallet. They are then pulled through a smaller cone to separate the fibers from the outer woody covering and the good fibers are picked out and spun into thread on a spindle. The fine linen thread is then woven into cloth on a loom. The earliest looms in Egypt were horizontal and the upright loom was brought to this country by the Hyksos. industry was papyrus paper making, for which the government had the monopoly. The lowest part of the stem is the best part for paper making. The outer green rind is peeled off and the white pith is sliced into thin strips which are soaked in water. After repeated soaking, the now pliable strips are placed on a piece of cloth in two layers, one vertical and one horizontal. The surface of the sheet thus formed is then hammered with a wooden mallet to cause the fibers of the two layers to stick together. The sheet is then covered with another piece of cloth and pressed between two heavy stones for several days. During that time it also dries out in the hot sun and the piece of paper is ready for use. 